Over the course of many years running tons of challenges on Souls games, I've realized I haven't come across much content that breaks down a realistic progression for starting challenges as a beginner. I'd say for most individuals playing Souls games that just want to have fun and aren't hardcore masochists, something as simple as not using a shield and not even co-oping would be a challenge in itself. So that's exactly where we're going to start off with this breakdown. Make sure to leave a comment if you've tried any of these runs or if the video inspired you to do the kinds of stuff I'll be talking about today. And don't forget to subscribe and be notified for future videos. So let's say that you're brand new to Souls games in general. You just beat your first playthrough of the game and you have no idea what character build is good. What items are the best overall and what strategies beat the bosses the quickest? You probably had a friend that helped you with advice or you looked at some walkthrough. Maybe you co-opt with some people online to get a helping hand or to help others yourself and learn the game from their world. Any of this could apply, but regardless, upon revisiting the game, a run where you cannot block with a shield and simply not summon other players for help will put a lot of the pressure on direct strategies or needing to level particularly useful stats that can make your character effective in other ways that you may have not known before. This could be looked at as something that's not challenging at all, but for some out there, it's a perfect starting point. Just beat the game solo, no blocking, no Havel's armor, no one-shot build, no funny business, you goddamn cheaters. I'm looking at you that guy who researches all the methods. As we move forward, this probably is where a majority of you would agree real challenge begins in terms of the rules and the difficulty level. A large but straightforward step up from no summoning, no shield, and no cheesy magic would be a no leveling run. It could be argued that no leveling for some of the games would be way too hard and would rank closer to the end of the list if we're going from the beginning to master level of challenge. But I would argue in most cases, it's the best type of run to do next because you don't have to reset the game every time you don't achieve the goal. In fact, the goal's viability simply depends on you chipping away at each boss on your own time and as many times as you need. This is the biggest benefit and why I would rank level one runs or no leveling as the second step of getting good. You're able to learn so much information from this run that it actually makes sense as a stepping stone for all the things to come up next on my list. In a level one run, you have not only limited survivability, but you're also forced to use limited actions with a much smaller amount of stamina than normal. For example, on a run where stat leveling is uncapped, having stamina allows you to roll several times more than a base level run. It would also allow you to panic roll a lot more and make more moves that are random and wouldn't be possible to get away with on level one. This means every action counts. This counts for how many attacks you can do. It sometimes may even go as far as a situation where you're spamming a boss down with a bunch of attacks and it's gonna charge up this big area of effect attack and you have to run away. Now you can't run away because you have no stamina left, whereas the character that had leveled has the stats. Depending on which Souls game you're in, this can greatly vary as well. Making games like Dark Souls 2 even worse for how many actions you can commit to in one stamina bar. The amount consumed per action is around double the amount of some of the other games. If we take a look at the character's equipment and build variety, we'll realize there's not a lot of weapons you can actually use on level one. You can meet requirements by using rings or other equipment that boost stats, but that's only gonna get you so far because of the cost to use them. The cost to use such equipment could affect your overall equip load, the stamina to use the weapon, and of course, the rings you could be using instead of the ones to boost the stats. This might be the only time I mention this, but one of the games that gets the weapon selection right when it comes to base level challenge runs is Neo. I only played the first Neo, so I'm not sure if this carried over in the sequel, but you could use pretty much any weapon, but with less effectiveness. This isn't the same effect that you have on a weapon that doesn't meet requirements, like when you're on level one and you try to swing it, but you can't. Because it retains the viability of the weapon, this makes it so much more fun, and I really hope From Software in the future will take notes of this and put it in one of their future games, because as far as we've gotten up to Elden Ring, they've never done this. And it's a huge thing to miss out on because some people want to play level one runs and they want to have more variety. And you can make the cost maybe 30% less effective for the weapons. I would be super happy with that. If any of you guys agree with this statement, please leave a comment below on what you think about level one runs and weapon variety. At the end of the day, even if you brute force the ugliest level one run anyone's ever witnessed and just barely managed to succeed, you would still leave with so much more information and experience than most first playthroughs could give you when it comes to raw data on how the game works, irrespective of the storyline and additional elements, which is amazing. As we go a bit deeper into the progression of noob to pro, you will notice my ideas are making significant jumps in concept and or difficulty. 
This particular challenge coming up could be argued to be just as difficult or not much different than a level one run, but it does have the aspect that quite a few of you may not like at all or have a hard time appreciating when attempting. The next step up from a level one run is none other than Deathless. On a Deathless playthrough, regardless of whatever Souls game you choose, you must restart the game completely from the beginning if you die once. The initial approach to improving here is best executed by not resetting, but rather counting deaths that you accumulate so that by the end of the playthrough, you have a baseline target to beat the next time you run the game. This makes it a much clearer goal to achieve because as you record the number of deaths, you will start to realize, I remember where I died specifically. I think the reason you remember is because you've set the intention to achieve the goal and therefore it makes it a lot more clear when you recall what happened. The deathless run will start to get you into a similar habit that you had on the level one run previously mentioned, where certain strategies don't apply at all anymore and you'll have to adopt new ones to overcome. But with more chips on the table and time spent to get your current personal best, the resetting nature can make deathless feel like a much bigger beast at times. The character can be built many different ways, and Deathless can be as sketchy or as comfortable as you want it to be. I'm sure a lot of you will find the longer you spend setting up the run, the worse it's going to be when you lose the challenge. Especially to a stupid death like Gravity, which is really common, especially in games like Dark Souls 1. You can fall off so many objects, and then at the end of it, you literally just get one shot, which sucks. Speaking of how long it takes to set up a run, and carefully curating your strategy to win, let's take a step further in that direction. Introducing the Zero Hit Run. A run where you actually can't be attacked by an enemy unless that hit is a scripted requirement to continue the game. Like Dragon God in Demon Souls and Invincible Seath the Scaleless in Dark Souls 1. This takes all the things that make Deathless scary and amplifies it to a point of near insanity for some people. This is also a level of gameplay where most people watching may never try, even though the community for Zero Hit Runs has grown so much ever since I started my first attempts in June 2016. There's this fun quality that exists in the previously mentioned categories on this progression list. A fun that's felt in still being able to have several options in how you want to approach the scenario. The no shield, no summoning is just a less handicapped first playthrough. The level one run, although pretty brutal to fight enemies, allows you to take your time. You can take as much time as you want. Even Deathless is kind of like that, where you get to pick exactly how much time you put into that character build. And if you want to take 20 hours to do a Deathless run, you can, or you could do it in an hour and a half. In my experience, the Hitless run is preferably done the quickest of all three previous comparisons, because who really wants to make a two hour run six hours long for no good reason? This is exactly the point why you don't see nearly as many character build varieties on Hitless Run videos, unless it can be justified with a certain time frame. Even some of the longest magic character runs, which are typically longer to set up, that are Hitless, still are much quicker than how long my original Deathless runs took. Being strict on your strategies and having a consistent flow to everything is super key in simplifying the run. Having fun in this context has a completely different meaning. Make no mistake, Hitless Runs are fun, but in a different type of way, a lot more serious way. Picture this, you think you're a masochist. You've done hard things. You're playing Dark Souls 1. Hey, I should do a hitless run, let's try. You get kinda good at it. The first run is kinda shitty, second run's pretty bad. Two weeks later, you make it all the way to Anne Orlando. You're at goddamn Ornstein and Smo and you haven't been hit by a single enemy. And then it finally happens. You realize you have to do this again, but better. That's where it gets pretty serious when it comes to fun. It's also very likely that you will reset on Ornstein and Smo, amongst a lot of other things, like things that are stupid easy that you know you can do that you've done before. You might have done them a hundred times in a row. Glitches that happen, random things like falling through the floor that don't happen to anyone else, where you start to victimize yourself, and even stupid hard things that you just actually have a skill progression that you need to progress through. It's just the nature of limiting the tolerance of what qualifies as a run from that progression of I'm restricting my levels all the way to I'm restricting getting hit. With the objective of not getting attacked by an enemy seeming unlikely, the goal is practice. Almost like you would practice for sports or for music. You need intentional repetitions with smaller goals inside the bigger goal to keep a good focus and attitude throughout the process. Like the deathless run, limited hit runs are a great starting point and in my opinion, necessary to get down to the goal of zero hits taken. While the next category is not significantly harder than a hitless run, 
it needs to be mentioned because it is the next step up naturally in the runs I've done over the years, as well as a nice achievement to have completed if you're already comfortable with the effort that goes into the hitless run. Damageless. They end up being about 50% harder on some of the games and more or less on others depending on which one you run. An example would be the damage bonus of Red Tearstone Ring, a ring that gives you in Dark Souls 1 50% damage bonus, is very viable. But on a game like Dark Souls 2 and 3, it's only 20% damage bonus. With the bonus being more than double in the first game, and the ring requiring you having lower health to activate, which actually isn't a violation of the goal in Hitless because inflicting self-damage doesn't actually count as an enemy hitting you, it still is a huge difference in terms of how easy it might be to kill enemies, which can greatly impact the learning curve and the difficulty of the run overall. In a damageless run, the health bar can't lower at all. This also segues into the situation where falling off things is taken very carefully. Some things you can fall off of without taking damage. Others you can use fall control or cat ring, which are items and magic to be able to reduce fall damage until the point of death. And then there's just some things where it doesn't work at all in games like Bloodborne where you don't have the ability to use items to help you. So you have to take a completely different route like Healing Church Workshop to get to Amelia not being viable anymore. Instead, you'd have to get the symbol from Cleric Beast and open the gate to the cathedral going straight forward up the steps rather than going around through Healing Church Workshop. Which is actually pretty tricky because Cleric Beast is not actually in a run normally, unless you're doing all bosses. So for example, on any percent where you just complete the mandatory amount of content, Cleric Beast being required before you get to Amelia is kind of stressful because it's adding a whole nother thing you have to do that's just not required on Hitless. Killing extra bosses becomes fairly common in some of the runs, and it's cool because it changes the challenge enough for hardcore Hitless runners to enjoy. There's also that amazing feeling that you actually completed the game perfectly, in the sense that you didn't get any health reductions whatsoever. One thing I personally went a step further with is not allowing my character to get staggered as well. So nothing made contact with the character's hitbox in the form of stagger or damage, which to me actually is the perfect playthrough of the game. Now we are getting into an even smaller margin of the player base, or dare I say the smallest margin of the player base, with marathon hitless runs. To make this a little bit more simplified, I'm going to include damageless marathon runs as well, as they're not nearly as popular, and there hasn't been any done to my knowledge, that have as many games included as the largest hitless marathon runs. You essentially get to this level when you've achieved such insane feats of mastery in the hitless and damageless categories that you're just simply bored with life overall, and your human-like excitement for games is just plain gone. You will never be pleased with anything anyone can ever design or create, and you must fabricate some sort of digital straitjacket and padded room to soothe your inner demons for the coming months and years to survive the bleak nature of our reality's limitations. Even you, the masochist, at this level of gameplay will realize that it's a whole different ballgame. When you do regular hitless and damageless runs, the average any percent or mandatory playthrough of content across all the Souls titles is under a couple of hours without glitches. Once you've completed a lot of these runs, it's easy to develop the habit of trying methods that are not intelligent for the goal as much as they're just purely entertaining to your curiosity and ego. I have fallen victim to this syndrome countless times, where it automatically becomes appealing to see what happens when I freestyle a random strategy or idea that I've rarely or never used before in a small situation. And this isn't even during practice, this is when the run has not yet been completed overall, and I'm on a good attempt as well. The philosophy seems to be with this mindset that you could just reset the run, you know? It's not that long of a run back, why not just try something fun? But it never really ends up benefiting you as much as you think it will. I know not every player is like this, but I think it's hilarious from a psychological standpoint because we went from the progression of not even being willing to reset the game all the way to, hey, I can reset as much as I want. Let's do a bunch of stupid stuff. This is the act of curiosity allowing quality to dwindle. In the context of marathon running, this will definitely come back to haunt you when you're three games deep, four games deep, maybe on the fifth game of a total of seven Soulsborne titles, including Sekiro, Demon Souls, Dark Souls Trilogy, which is what people have been doing. And you decide to make a really silly decision because your habits have been hardwired to have your curiosity lead before common sense. The best part I've noticed in my experience is even the audience won't even understand what you're doing. They'll agree your choice was bad, but you just love the flavor of unpredictable ideas with all that pressure on you. Luckily, a ton of the best players of all time are not like this. 
I and a few others definitely are. Gino Machino, for an example, is a great mention in this topic because he is known to be super efficient in practice and execution, which sometimes leads you to not have situations like I've mentioned I've had. I would argue that he's only gotten better in those aspects as he recently just completed the run I mentioned seven games back to back. Sekiro, Demon Souls, Bloodborne, and the Dark Souls trilogy, as well as Elden Ring, and he didn't get hit at all in the entirety of it. The craziest thing to mention is that he hasn't even really been into marathon runs for that long. The only way we can increase the difficulty from his recent seven game hitless run would be doing it again without leveling, or maybe even doing it damageless, or even on top of that, doing it damageless and without leveling. Now you can kind of see the trend that's happening with this list as we keep increasing the difficulty of these challenges. There's always something else to improve, but at what cost? This is the current perceived peak of Souls challenge runs, I've realized. And while of course you can make other conditions and modifications to the games, this is the largely recognized core progression. I'd like to run through a bunch of honorable mentions for extra ideas that can also be a ton of fun when challenging yourself. All Achievements is a great run for collectathon enthusiasts. Pacifist playthroughs can be tricky to figure out, but entertaining to witness, just for the fact that it can be done without you actually being involved in combat. An unupgraded weapon run sounds extremely scary, but is a great gap to bridge on the way to level 1, because you can find a lot of weapons that are good without upgrades, but still do slightly less damage than a level 1 character, and remain with the bonus of having more health overall, which makes survivability no problem. Certain modified playthroughs such as item and enemy randomizers are worth trying for my PC players in the case that it trains your knowledge and resourcefulness with what you're given. There's even been charity marathons and tournaments where people race on randomizer seeds, and those randomizer seeds have also been used for not only speedruns, but even hitless runs, like the one little Aggie's trying to do, I believe right now, on Elden Ring, where he randomizes the entire game and is able to do a hitless run. I believe his personal best is one hit, and I'm sure he'll get it. Now, I'm sure someone already typed this in the comments before I could even get to this point of the video. But on the topic of speedrunning, it's important to mention that it is a huge challenge that can scale to a level that's close to the deepest level or even beyond, depending which game world record we're talking about. For now, I decided to not rank any speedruns amongst the challenge runs to not confuse the two different types of challenges. Well, later on, I could definitely do a video on just speedruns if you'd like. Please leave a comment below if you want to see me ranking different things in speedrunning the Souls games. If speed is something you enjoy, and killing bosses as fast as possible gives you a rush, try out a glitchless speedrun with safer strats to start off and see where it goes from there. Some of the tricks used on the fastest categories are more difficult to master in my opinion than the entire first section of the challenges in this video. Things like fair and skip in Dark Souls 3, certain quick kills in Bloodborne like Lawrence, or even just being able to string moveset swapping, soul duplication and tumble buffing into your fancy footwork along the way all while having crisp menuing efficiency took me tons of time back when I was speedrunning. If you made it to this point of the video, thank you so much for watching, guys. Be sure to leave your opinion on what other challenges you would add to this list, and what you think about anything I have listed. All my socials are in the pinned comment as usual, and don't forget to check out my second YouTube channel, Squilla Plays, for everything unedited, and all the first playthroughs of the games not uploaded to the main channel. The goal is to get the second channel to 1,000 subscribers, and around 4,000 hours of watch time so I can get it monetized, and then I can afford to commission more videos from my editor for the main channel, which means most likely two videos a week. So if you guys think that's cool, then definitely go sub to the second channel and help us out. Also, just leave one of the videos playing when you go to sleep if it's easy for you to do. And I'll see you in the next one. Switches back to that new set. Okay, so we gotta go into that part with a lot more help. We gotta get the first part down perfectly.